This is the Iron Sharpens Iron Movement, sharing insights into the power of people-centric leading. Hi, this is Jim, and today we welcome to our tribe someone who helps others to find that missing link towards building a vision so vivid and filled with excitement that life seems to make an abrupt stop in course correct. He reminds all of us that it is possible to thrive in this high-paced world of business and enjoy life to the fullest. This is Dylan Ali. The Iron Sharpens Iron movement is brought to you by N2 Growth, a leader in executive search, leadership development, and talent management. We find and develop the world's best leaders. Learn more about our practice by visiting us at n2growth.com or click on the link in the show notes of this podcast. Hey, Dylan, welcome to the Iron Sharpens Iron movement. We're so happy to have you here today. And I will have to selfishly admit, I have been waiting to talk to you, man. So welcome to the show. Well, thank you, man, James. I really appreciate the time. I appreciate the energy investment. And uh, I, too, have been uh, pretty excited. I know that we had a chance to just communicate via the uh the Google machine, if you will. And, uh, you know, I've been looking, I've been looking forward to just kind of sit down and chop it up with you and have this conversation. So thank you so much for making the time and space for me today. Yeah, real privilege. Uh, and you know, one of the genesis of, of this show is iron sharpens iron, the name itself, right? It's about finding other people that kind of think and act like we do in the tribe and um, challenging the way that we think, challenging the way that we act to make ourselves better, right? It's, it's, it's that grinding, it's that forging that makes a, you know, a sword sharper and iron sharpens iron in that aspect. And I know you're going to do that today. I think you're going to challenge our thinking of how a lot of us are just stuck in the way that we are in our lives and kind of the way that we've been brought up, how to be old school leaders and you're really going to break us out of those shells today. So that's why I've been giddy about uh, waiting for the time to do this podcast. It's going to be awesome. So let me ask you right off the bat, because it's something that you ask people right away. Are you sinking or swimming? I am floating on a giant floating man <laughs> with margaritas on each side. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It wasn't always that way, though, right? God, no, man. Um Listen, the reason the reason I'm floating today is because I was once sinking. And, you know, I have this belief that um, you can't know or appreciate good unless you know bad. And without, you know, without ugly, there is no beauty. And so, um, yeah, I've I've sank. I've sank all the way to the bottom at times. It felt like I've grasped. I've grasped for air. I've gasped for air. I beat the water up, all that fun stuff. And so, um, yeah. Much like many people, I've been sinking, I've sunk, I've drowned, I've drowned and come back. And so, you know, any version of it that you want to go look at, I've been there. And that's why it feels so good to be able to swim and float and enjoy, you know. Um, and I say I'm floating on a raft, but the reality is, is I've just I've just learned to, you know, you ever lay in the ocean or in the water or in a pool or something and just kind of float on your back? Oh, yeah. And it's about controlling that breath, right? Yep. And for me, again, it's back to breath. I've learned to control the breath, so now I can float in any storm. I tell you, you know, and, and we have storms out there, you know, for anybody that's listening to this podcast in the future, we're still in the midst of the COVID pandemic. You know, some states are just barely getting into that second phase of, of re loosening some restrictions, but the realities are this whole world's been turned upside down in the last few months. And I think everybody is going to need a little bit of this resilience that you'll talk to us about today, not only professionally, but personally, ex uh, especially. So, you know, Dylan, you, you, you talked about, you know, this whole level of experience, you know, and where you're, you're f been flailing in the water, barely surviving, and now you're floating. And so, you know, you, you've got stuff to share with us. And I'd love to know your journey of self-discovery about really how you got to the point to where you feel like you're floating now compared to how you really were flailing. And I think most of us understand that there's a lot of selfish leaders out there. There's a lot of selfish people out there. And, and one of the things that this, this iron sharpens iron movement, I think most of our listeners have come to agree that it's the power of the human to make you a good leader. And so it's about that, you know, that your own self-discovery about looking inward. I'd love to know some of your thoughts on that, about just what makes you a good person. 
I'll start by saying I, I think I think a lot of people expect this big aha moment. And, you know, and I was having I was on a, another podcast last night and it really hit me. I had the aha moment that there was no aha moment. And <laughs> the moment that I shared a lot was just ego driven for the sake of the audience, because I felt like I had to paint a picture that we're used to because every movie, right. There's an aha moment where the yeah. wimpy guy turns into the hero, right. Or the, uh, or the nerdy chick with the glasses turns into the sex goddess or whatever. Right. Right. And so there was no aha moment. I think that I think that the minute that we decide to show up, we're on this journey, whether we accept it or we recognize it or not. And for me, it's been those little bits and clues all along. And I think each and every one of us at some point in life believe that we have the capability of being a leader. And that may look like a fireman. It may look like a doctor, a lawyer, a superhero or a policeman or whatever it is. But then as we continue on, that light gets dim and dim and dim. And for me, that light just kept showing up. And so I knew from what I would say is a relatively young age in my career that I had something more. And I remember even at one point, um, someone told me, they said, uh, I can't remember exact words, but he literally said to me like, um, why are you gonna do that? You're not a leader. Ooh, that one really stung. And how many of us dim that light because, you know, people say stuff like that to us. And so for me, you know, that could have been a pivot in moment, you know, if we want to label it, but it just kind of got stuffed away. And I knew that I, I was always that person that would influence and would lead and would impact. But I also knew that I wasn't in a position. I didn't feel it. I wasn't living it. And so for me, it was just simply removing that resistance. So there wasn't really an aha moment, but that's really kind of how it started. It was like, oh, man, I have something more to give. Like I'm really, I've always been really good at anything that I've done. And, um, you know, the reality is, is it's not that hard to be good at things. Um, and so part of it too was, you know, maybe even the boredom of like, this is really good. There's got to be something more. So it's all those little prompts that, that got me always searching and seeking. And one time I remember a buddy of mine even said, he goes, man, I remember I was, I remember I was where you're at. You're always seeking, you're always looking. And the conversation was almost a little bit limiting. Like, oh, I remember when I was where you are, junior. And, you know, one day you're going to grow up and you're not going to search. But here's the reality of it. I love to experiment. I love to explore and I love to search. And it's just part of who I am. And what I was able to do is, you know, you mentioned the word selfish. I learned to become selfish because society says that good leaders are not selfish. Society says that good people are not selfish, right? But the reality is, is I'm very selfish. If I wasn't selfish, I wouldn't be here. I chose to come into this existence as a big brown man with beard, with tattoos, with earrings, with a little bit of an edge and with a little bit of an ego and a little bit of style and a little bit of fashion sense and a little bit of articulation. Why? Because I knew that all of those pieces would give me the experiences that I need to become whole. I never strive for perfection. Perfection is when I'm six feet under. I'm not broken. I'm certainly, I'm just not whole. And if I can, if I can use this avatar that I chose to come into the world, and if I can become very selfish and in tune with what this avatar is here for, now my cup is filled and now I can pour into my team. So you say selfish, I say self first. Yeah, I love that, Dylan. I love that because I, I, I had... I did have an aha moment not too long ago, actually. I was in South Africa, and I was uh, talking to the minister of finance. I was on this big trip for work, and uh, and I was telling him that I believe in servant leadership. I believe I'm a servant leader, and, um, you know, and I just went through all the kind of things about, you know, how I've always, I've been called to serve, you know, I, all my time in the military, and even when I was leading, it was always about the others. It was about team first, all those things, and he says, Jim... He goes, I have a better word for you, which will allow you to expand yourself even longer. And it's steward 
leadership. Instead of being a servant leader, be a steward of leading. And it encompasses servant. But I will tell you, Dylan, what I think is important to the point that you brought up, it's okay to be self-first on a lot of things. And if you're a steward, if you believe in steward leadership instead of just servant leadership, where I have to give everything away, it's okay to be a little bit selfish. Because for you to be the right leader and a great leader, you've got to take self first uh, to account. You have to. You just have to. And I, I love that you bring that point that you got to invest in yourself first. There's no doubt about yeah. that. You have to be selfish because as a leader, I can't, you know what? And especially now, given the temperature of the world, right? We're going to hear, we're going to hear these words so much that we're going to be sick of it. Holding space, empathy, authenticity, and transparency. The unfortunate thing James, is that's just going to become another set of buzz, buzzwords for marketing. Yeah. And so You're right. the real and the truest leaders are going to be selfish, self first, and they're going to dissolve the judgment because guess what? It doesn't feel good when I judge myself. They're going to dissolve the comparison. They're going to dissolve the expectations. And now when you and I are having a conversation, if I'm truly holding space for you, I don't expect you to, to have an outcome that looks like X, Y, Z. I'm not judging you in the moment that you're telling me all this stuff. And I don't have comparison to go, oh, right now I'm better than you are or vice versa. Now, if I can dissolve those within myself, hmm. then as a leader, I can truly hold space for you. Then as a leader, I can objectively give you direction. Then as a leader, I can lead. But it all starts from within. Yeah, I love that. I love that. But, you know, like a lot of people, though, they're programmed to not listen to themselves. They're programmed to, you know, they're, they're so busy. The white noise is going on. Uh, you know, they've been, you know, I've got a Harvard MBA and that's all that counts. You know, I will naturally lead because of what my education is. Uh, you know, I think we both believe that's a fallacy. But what are some of the skill sets that you think need to be taught about that self first kind of perspective. What are some things that people aren't getting there? There's an obvious thing that you have to have certain levels of education. You got to have certain levels of training. You certainly have to have experiences, education, training experiences is kind of the cornerstone of some things. But once you get there, you're some people can be hollow as a leader. So what, what are some of these things that allow you to turn inward and and change the needle a little bit. Because again, right, you know, Dylan, if you take two people, one's from Harvard and one's from Dartmouth, and they have these same types of, you know, they all go to the same schools. They have all of about the same type of experiences in company A and company B. What moves the needle, though? You know, from a human perspective, what makes a better leader? I like the word human in there, because again, we've all chosen, I, you know, I, I buy into that theory that we're all spiritual beings having human experiences, but we chose to be human and the humans come with, you know, a little bit of framework. And so let's tap into that framework before there's anything else, before there's commitment, there's discipline. So you go, you read all the books, you get the education. Doesn't mean that you're an automatic leader. It means that you have the theory of leadership down, but now you need to put into practice. And so I often say that imitation is the first form of learning. So you go to school, you learn all this stuff, you come out, you're not really a leader, you're imitating what you think a leader should look like. Exactly. Um, and now as you create your own experiences, then you start to form your own opinions. Then most leaders don't get to this point where they take the knowledge and they integrate it into wisdom. Wisdom says that I read in a book that XYZ equals ABC, Knowledge says I take that, I integrate it a little bit, I learn, I regurgitate it, I recognize it, I know how to describe it down to the core. Wisdom is I've had the opportunity in life to recognize that my XYZ has equaled ABC. Now I have that experience and I've been able to reflect the knowledge and the framework behind it. It's truly become integrated. So until you can get to that, there take, it takes discipline. It takes discipline to set the alarm that says, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to be creative for an hour and write. I'm going to get my thoughts out on paper. Then I'm going to sit down the next day and I'm going to articulate what lessons I get out of that. 
discipline says, and I'm going to tra- I'm going to go from that simple basic exercise now to bring that from paper into thought. Then I'm going to take that thought and that visualization. And I'm going to bring it into the you know into the present moment. Then I'm going to take that and I'm going to manifest it into the leader that I want to become. But before there's all of that framework, there's just discipline. Discipline that says I'm going to do the basics. It's like you, you're a military guy, right? Um, think about this. Boot camp is the it's the best coaching out there, man. Because <laughs> when you because when you leave military boot camp after three months, I know three things, and I'm I'm not a military guy, but I know you got abs, and it's God, country, and <laughs> right, God, country, and family. That's right. That's exactly right. And I know, and I know that for whatever reason, regardless if you want to or not, when you leave boot camp, when you hear shots fired. Normal people are going to run one way. You're going to run towards it. Why? Because simply you've been reprogrammed. You've been, let's just call it what it is. You've been brainwashed. You've been programmed. Now, I say there's nothing wrong with that. So let's take that framework and let's use that to brainwash us into the things that we want. I want to become a better leader. I want to be more empathetic. I want to have less judgment. I want to dissolve expectations. I want to dissolve comparison. I want to be able to hold space. Great. Let's take that framework. And let's brainwash the old program in and input the new. Yep. And it starts with the discipline. The discipline, listen, you didn't have the discipline to wake up at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. every morning and go run 10 miles, right? That's right. So you had a you had a you had a horn, you had a bell, you had a drill sergeant, <laughs> you had something to get you out of there. So you know what? So for the people that that know what to do, that have the the Harvard MBAs, that have you know all of the tools and resources. Maybe sometimes they just need someone to punch them in the gut along the way. And that is why I'm a coach. That is why I'm a speaker, because I would say if you've tried it and you don't know how to do it, and if you don't know how to put the pieces together, find someone that is doing it. Find someone that you like the way they vibe, you like the way they groove, and literally ask them to teach you how to do what it is that they do. So Dylan, be be our drill instructor today. Be our drill instructor. The the horn is just uh, gone off. You've thrown the trash can down the middle of the aisleway. We're wide awake. What are some of these things that uh, that probably ninety five percent of the people out there are unaware of that they could change in their daily routines, their daily lives that would make them a better person? The number one, I would think I would say, and this is something I do with my coaching clients, it is acknowledge. Acknowledge that you have a problem. Acknowledge that you're not a good leader, first of all. Because guess what? We get the title and we get the paycheck and, oh, my God, all of a sudden we're a leader. No, at best, you're a manager right now, baby Bob, right? (laughs) Leadership is something that's learned. You know, you talked about servant leadership. Um, that's a concept that Lao Tzu talked about 2,500 years ago. It's nothing new. That's and correct. so, the, yeah, the first thing is to just acknowledge that, hey, I need some help here. And that's where the discipline comes in. The discipline comes in and just being able to be, to have truth. So you want, you, you want drill instructor dialing? It's number one, speak your fucking truth. Recognize that, you know what? I'm not a good leader and I'm responsible for not only 10 people right now, but I'm responsible for their livelihood, which means I'm responsible for about 30 people. Because if each one of those people have an average family size of three, I'm not just managing this person day to day. I'm leading them. I am teaching them. I am mentoring them. So acknowledge that, hey, I don't have the skill set to give the people what it is that they need. Now, here's the thing. Most leaders are truly just managers and they're there to collect the paycheck because they were really good at individual contributorship. And someone said, Hey, you're really good at what you do. So let's just teach everyone else. And here's the problem. Most strong ICs are very, very selfish and narrow minded and very focused. And right. And so we, I, I think it's number one that says, Hey, yesterday I was a great IC and today I'm in management, but I really want to be a leader and I'm not a leader. So Number one, it's just acknowledging and just having to tell and just tell yourself and accept the hard truth that I'm not a leader and I desire to be a good leader. Okay, great. Now we're getting somewhere. Now, once you've made now, once you've made the acknowledgement of where it is you are and where you don't want to be, guess what? That that starts to create the clarity of where you do want to be. And then the next thing is to, you know, once you acknowledge where you are, you accept it. 
Okay, I'm not a good leader. Okay, what does that mean? It doesn't matter what that means. It is what it is. Let's accept it, right? Let's yep. acknowledge it. Let's accept it. And now let's action. Let's take action. Now, I've gotten you out of bed in the morning. You know you're out of shape. You know you don't have any discipline. You don't know any of this. I've, sh I've, I've shaken you. You have no choice as a good soldier but to accept it because if not, push-ups, right? <laughs> right, that's right. And now, and now you use that little bit of a jolt to move you into action. And I don't remember what book it was I consumed this in, but there was a little diagram, and the words were do, want to do, and can do. And, you know, the, the little spiral of circle says, hey, we typically want to do things, but we don't do them because – we got to figure, we, we typically got to realize that we can do it and then we do do it. That's a long drawn out process. I say, if you want to start running, just get out and run, do it. And then when you yeah. recognize that you can do it, then you're going to recognize that you want to do it. So acknowledge, accept, take action. And then you're going to realize, oh man, this really isn't bad. I'm finding out stuff about myself. I actually love myself. Oh my gosh, I heal this, I heal that. Now you want to do it. And then just like anything else, just like that fifth beer, you're never going to get to that fifth beer unless you drink that first one, right? That's right. It's just like anything else, man. Listen, here's the thing. Our human minds are insatiable. I eat good food. I want more food. I have great sex. I want better sex, right? I want the greatest yeah. sex. I have a fast car. I want a faster car. Well, so tap true. into that because, because now once you get a taste of that leadership and you get a taste of that influence and that impact and you start dissolving some of those fears and anxiety you start feeding that love it becomes contagious and then all of a sudden you're reading the right books you're watching the right videos you're speaking to the right person but even more important you don't have to consciously go after that because once you start getting in tune with who you are and what it is that you bring to the world what you are seeking is also seeking you so the minute that you start seeking leadership and stewardship it is also seeking you and guess what if you have the courage and the discipline to go within and go feed that, it has always been in you, and now it starts to grow. Now it starts to bloom. And now you grow into that leader, the one that you've always been. Yeah, I, that's a bumper sticker right there. What you are seeking is also seeking you. That is, uh, that's just an amazing statement, right? That's, that's one of those that makes you just kind of sit up a little bit more right now and pay a little bit more attention right now. I think that's just, a, it's a truism, right? It's a truism for sure. It so, is. It absolutely is. You know, so, you know, you, you, you give us this guidance and you kind of have these awakening moments and all of these kind of things. I, I know you're a big meditator. And have you found that meditation brings a lot of these actionable skill sets to greater focus? Does it allow, does it center you um, to listen to yourself to say, this is why I'm moving out. These are the paths that I should be seeking all of those things. Tell me about your discovery into meditation and, and the real power that it brings. Meditation allows us to create space. That's it. So I won't bore you with all the science and the physical stuff that goes on, but you know, in a nutshell, literally for every minute that you spend in Medita in that meditative state um, is the equivalent of, you know, you sleeping and resting for X amount of time. Now, when I huh. say in that meditative state, because I'll have a lot of people that go, oh, yeah, I meditate too. And my meditation is playing the guitar and my meditation is running or this. Absolutely, those are form of meditation, but I'm talking about a different game. I'm mm. talking about, listen, yeah, you may get out of your mind and you're getting out of the ego mind, but you're still in the body. And for me, Dylan's world meditation is going beyond the body, going beyond the mind, because I recognize that the 90% of me that is non-physical, the greater percentage of me that is non-physical is beyond the body, beyond the mind. And, yeah. you know, I might, I tell people all the time when we develop friendships, I go, listen, just so you know, I'm a bad friend. There are times I'm not going to return your text for a day or two. There are times I'm going to look at the phone and you're calling me. I'm going to choose to not answer it. You're going to send me book recommendations. You're going to send me podcasts. You're going to send me memes. And I'm not going to look at them hmm. because the reality is, is that I know that everything that I need is within. And I wow. know that the books that I need, I will be guided to. 
the podcast or whatever it is that I need, I will be guided to. And again, it's my rules and my beliefs that say that I don't want to fil- I don't want to have to filter noise, so I choose to not consume noise. And that's what meditation does for me. It guides me too, so I don't have to go listen to every podcast that someone recommends me to. Right? I know that meditation is going to say, you know what? Tune into James's podcast today. Okay. And I tune into James's podcast, and he's got this crazy guy dialing on there, but dialing. Out of 59 minutes, one minute, he says the thing that I've been searching for. Yeah. That's what meditation does for me. It gives me the space to allow me to be led to the things that are going to fulfill my division. And those things are typically lessons that I need. So then meditation allows me to not judge the situation. It allows me to not judge myself and to judge the people around me. And so that I can truly get to the lesson, if you will, from the quote unquote negative situation. Meditation allows me to hold space so that when you're having a bad day and you're coming at me, I'm not just shooting from the hip trying to protect myself. Because when I protect myself, all I'm doing is trying to protect my insecurities. Huh. Meditation yeah. gives me the you're space right. to say, yeah, meditation gives me the space to say, hey, James is coming at me right now. But instead of you know me going, hey, James is a, a, you know, a bad person, I can have the space to recognize that right now. James's ego is needing to feel significant because he he feels very uncertain and he needs certainty because I know the way he's wired because I recognize some cues in his language and his experience and in his body that says that he thrives on certainty. So right now he feels uncertain. So his need for significance is there. But you know what? He also has a big need um, for connection. And right now what he's really looking for is connection, but it's coming out as significance. And so if I can put all that aside and I go to what James needs and I give James what he needs and now guess what? The conversation becomes better. And now as an empathetic leader, Jack Welch wow. said it best, right? Leaders, you know, managers say, look what I did. Leaders say, look what we did. And That's right. even better, you know, the best leaders allow people and enable people. So now the people say, look what we did. No, that's that's beautiful. And you know, Dylan, it's it's interesting. It's you talked about that one minute of purity, you know, if somebody hears it. It's 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 how I found you. You know, I'm a big believer in fate and destiny and those yes. kind of things. And you know, there there's a reason, you know, don't be afraid that you took the left instead of the right. You'll figure it out at some point down the road. It's gonna be apparent. And it's the same thing here. It's so funny. I have been searching to have conversations with the right people, not just have conversations with people. You can do that all day long, but it's with the right people. And to make sure, you know, anybody that's, that's listening to this, you know, if they invest, you know, this 45 minutes of time that it's, it's a good investment. And, and it's all about that. And I was reflecting on, you know, I want to find people that carry the righteous message of, you know, human centric leading and, and how to be a better human and all that. And literally, as I was doing that, uh, one of your videos on meditation came up and, uh, it, it was an amazing thing. And I was like, I have got to find Dylan and I have got to talk to him. It's, <laughs> it's Thank a you. true story. And, uh, and it, and it's, uh, it's amazing to hear your words about how important this is, uh, in the, in the sequence of all of this. So when we first came on this morning, you did start talking about uh, breath also. So this is this is a this is a difference. It's a it's a change from what we're talking about in meditation itself. Um, but you're a big uh, believer in breath work too, aren't you? Absolutely. So um, the quality of our breath is the quality of the way we feel. The quality of the way we feel is the quality of our thoughts. The quality of our thoughts is the quality of our words and actions. The quality of our words and actions is the quality of our reality. That is a that is a framework that I subscribe to very heavily. So for me, it all starts at breath. Let me break it down a little bit more um, layman's term. Everyone says that the body, you know, where the mind goes, the body will follow. So the body yeah, is the mind. But what, what we forget to go is layers deeper. And really, the mind follows the heart. Where the heart goes, the mind goes, then the body goes. But even more so, it's the energy. The heart follows the energy. And so for me, it's back to the energy. It's settling in the energy. And breath is a way 
to align that energy. So let's talk about what's going on in your body, first of all. The reason I'm big on breath is the typical human, the normal human, breathes 12 to 25 times per minute. Most of us use only 10 to 20% of our lung capacity. The lungs are broken into five lobes, the upper lobes and the three lower lobes. Most of us are typically in fight or flight because we're breathing like <laughs> so much, yep. like so fast. Now, if you're willing to do an exercise with me, let's do that. Sure. You're willing to do an exercise with me? Let's okay. do we've it. Been having a, we've been having a great conversation. There's no stress. There's no anxiety. But let's do this exercise and let's see if we can recognize the state shift. So we're going to just do six breaths. And I'm going to give you a, a five count inhale, five count exhale. And just listen to my listen to my prompt. And if you will, just maybe get still, close your eyes. You ready? I'm ready. All right. We're going to inhale. Inhale. And let me back up. I want you to focus on inhaling through your nose and exhaling through your nose. If you're not used to this, it may be a little hard. So just be okay. easy on yourself. And focus on filling your belly up with air instead of your chest. Got it. And when you exhale... When you inhale, you blow up the inner tube. When you exhale, you deflate it. So as you deflate, as you exhale, pull your belly button back to your spine. Okay. Fair enough? I see it. All right. Here we Fair go. Fair enough. All right. Let's go. Ready? Inhale. One, two, three, four, five. Exhale. One, two, three, four, five. Inhale. One, two, three. Three, four, five. Exhale. One, two, three, four, five. Inhale. One, two, three, four, five. Exhale. One, two, three, four, five. Inhale. One, two, three, four, five. Exhale. One, Two, three, four, five. Inhale. One, two, three, four, five. Exhale. One, two, three, four, five. One more. Inhale. One, two, three, four, five. Exhale. One, two, three, four, five. And open your eyes. Wow. That was six breaths in one minute. That is half of the time that the average human time, human being breathes. How do you feel? I feel clearer. I actually had a, my posture started to uh, improve every single cycle. I was finding myself standing straighter. I was able to breathe deeper each time. And I became very self-aware, very self-aware of how uh, I was expanding and blowing back out. And it, uh, and my fo when I opened my eyes, my focus is greater a little bit. Now, do you feel anxiety? Do you feel elevated? Or do you feel calm? Oh, very calm, very calm. I I found myself forgetting we're talking and um and just listened to your voice and uh and i could feel myself um very so, calm very calm so so what's happening is you're activating the parasympathetic nervous system within your body and there's mm. a japanese study that says that six deep breaths is a magic number and now that i've rec now that i've learned even more since i reckon since i learned about that study you know, it's slowing that breath down to basically half of what we typically breathe. And because of that, you're activating the parasympathetic nervous system, which activates the vagus nerve, which is responsible mm. for releasing the calming chemicals in your body. So when you can find breath, now you have the space. So now you're not thinking about spreadsheets. You're not thinking about my wife or husband yelled at me. You're not thinking about the kids not doing their homework. You're not thinking about what's going on. You're centered. And from that space, now I use breath to prime also 
to get ready to get into meditation. So now that I've quote unquote emptied the trash and my mind is a lot more still, I can move into that meditative state where I can go beyond and not feel my nose and my toes. So for me, breath is really important. It's the basis of what we do. I fasted, you know, 75 hours at a time. I think that's a max. The max one I've done is 75 hours. You can go wow. days without water. Um, I have friends that to this day still compete in like physique shows and bodybuilding and stuff. And common practice is they water deplete a couple days before they get on stage. Now, mm. when they're in a depleted state of water, they're pretty cranky. They're pretty moody. They're pretty life is not comfortable, <laughs> but they're still alive. Right. But you know what? The record holder for holding your breath is 22 minutes. And that's, that's in an oxygenated. Yeah, that's an oxygenated state. So that's me doing some breath work or getting some oxygen and priming my body, activating the ANS and then holding. Mm. Now the world record for just a dude showing up and get me going, Hey James, hold your breath. Boom. Without any prep is 11 minutes. Wow. Unbelievable. The average human. Yeah. The average human cannot hold their breath for a minute. If you can hold your breath yeah. for over 40 seconds, you're doing pretty well. That's crazy. Right. It's crazy to think, right? Right. Yeah, and that's and very so true. Me, and so for me, recognizing that breath is just the basic, because without breath, I don't have anything else. So what's the number one job of your mouth? To eat. Well, people would say to eat. That's exactly right. right. It is. And second is to speak. But what is the number one job of the nose? To breathe. To breathe smell. and to smell. Yes, to breathe. So this is why we breathe through the nose. This is why the body is designed to breathe through the nose. So here's what's going on. When I breathe through the nostrils, those two little narrow chambers, they supercharge the air and they spin it up into the nostril cavity faster. That's mm -hmm. where the magic happens. So number one, there's this little filtration system in our nostrils to get rid of all the bacteria, get rid of all the stuff in the air, to purify it. It also warms the air. And so now when it becomes, when it gets into that nasal cavity, that's where it starts converting to nitric oxide. So now mm. when I breathe down into my lungs, if I breathe from my mouth, that's not happening, number one. Number two, if I breathe from my mouth, I'm only accessing those two upper lobes. When I breathe through my nose, it pushes beyond the upper lobes into the lower lobes. Now I'm pushing nitric oxide into my blood system that gets pumped out from those lower lobes in through my circulatory system. So now I can feel the energy of being awake. And now I can feel the energy of more clarity. Now I can feel the energy of all the things that you felt by simply breathing through my nose. Hmm. So there's a lot more going on, right? Yep. Yep. Now, I'm just saying the body's amazing, isn't it? And, yes. and it's like, it's, it's, it, it all and it starts with that. It starts with this very primal, you know, connection to understanding it before you can take that first step forward in doing anything else. It it's amazing. It it is and it's amazing. free, and it's free. That's exactly yes. right. Yeah. What do you so uh, is? Would you say that breathing, the breathing technique, the six deep breaths, um. Do you, does it work in stress scenarios? You know, so like you're you're going into a meeting, uh, you're expecting you know an important phone call to come, you know all those kind of things. Is this one of those foundational techniques that you know it will help just completely bring the calm from within the storm? Uh, and it you know any if somebody can be self aware enough that they are reaching a stress environment or they're into this you know kind of crisis management, this is one of those things you just tap your leg and say let's do six uh, deep breaths, and um, the world can change for you that quickly. This is where the discipline piece comes in. So now you have the <laughs> back knowledge. to discipline. Now you have the knowledge, right? And now it's the discipline of using the knowledge because that's how you transmute knowledge into wisdom. So the answer is yes. This technique that I just gave you, it's a great Band-Aid. And real life scenario, I, I've shared this story many times because it's something that I lived up until even not too long ago. And today I'm sure that I would find the opportunity to use it. So, you know, I lived my life in uh, 60, 60 minute blocks, right? Back as a sales guy, I got 60 Cat. minutes to have this meeting with you. Now, as a salesperson, um, you know, 
very often I was running behind. Now, you know what? I show up to the meeting five minutes late. I walk in. I'm stumbling all over myself. I'm frazzled. Now the meeting starts, you know, 20 minutes late, 10, 15 minutes late. So I only have 45 minutes to stumble through my presentation and hope that I just don't look like an idiot. Ah. That's, pre that's pretty common, right? <laughs> that's right. Yes. All right. Now, now let's, let's paint this picture. I'm five minutes late. I'm already late. So I turn off the vehicle. I turn off everything. I got the windows rolled up and it's quiet. And I do this for one minute. We have 1,440 minutes a day. I'm only asking you for one of that 1,440. The other 1,439, you can do whatever you want with. If I can give myself, if I can have the discipline to give myself the grace and honor myself for that one minute. Now, guess what? I walked in and now I'm six minutes late. But yeah. because I've had that state shift, now I walk in and I simply say, James, my apologies for being late. With your permission, I'd love to get started. And we get started. And now, now, instead of having 45 minutes or whatever of stumbling, I literally now have what? I was five minutes late. I walked in a minute. I took a minute to intro. So now I have 53 minutes to have probably one of the best meetings I've ever had in my life. And do you believe that's transferable also? Is, is your sense of calm transferable to the person that you're near. Oh my goodness. You ever walk into a room and, and you're like, I got to meet this dude, man. He's awesome. Like, I don't know what it is, but there's something about him. Or if you're walking into a room and you're like, I know I'm not talking to that person. I don't want any of that bad juju on me tonight. That's right. So Absolutely. I don't know the, I don't know the exact number. And, and so you can fact check me on this, but Energy travels something like 9,000 times faster than words or thoughts. So for me, by walking into that room, if I'm in a flustered state, guess what? Everyone in that room has some perception of what time looks like, of, you know, respect my time and this and that and the other. So we don't know what they're dealing with. So if I walk in with that flustered energy, yeah, they're going to feel it. But if I walk in in that calm energy, number one, depending on where they are mentally, right, they're, they're waiting for an excuse. They're yeah. probably already got their response for my excuse. But if I walk in and I'm in such a calm state that I diffuse it by simply saying, James, I apologize for being late. With your permission, may I get started? Wow, that just diffused a lot of that stress and anxiety, right? You bet it does. And so so when you can come from that space, you don't have to say a word. Just by showing up in the right frame of energy, you can diffuse a lot of the fear and anxiety that's in the room. And, you know, coming from the world of sales, I can tell you that even the most successful salespeople, most of us are leading from a state of fear. Most of us, when we walk in the room, we go, oh, man, you know what? So-and-so was just here two days ago. And, man, I know their price is usually you know, better than mine. And they beat me on the last deal. So we're coming from behind anyway. Now, if hmm. you can set the tone of the energy and switch from that scarcity mindset to that abundance mindset, when you walk in, right now you have the space to say things like, you know, James, when you send the PO, just make sure that you send me an email so that I can handhold this process from A to Z, because I don't want anything to mishap because we got to make this date up to 20 seconds. Does that sound good? Hmm. Guess what? Amen. Now, now I can use those bits of psychology and that bit, that bit of hypnotic language and that, and I can get body. Now I can leave the sale. So guess what? There's a lot of cool things that happen from meditation and breath work, but the best thing from a sales guy's perspective, it's going to improve my close rate. <laughs> that's, that's true. You are true. It's funny. I used to, when I, when I would teach back in the military, I would teach uh, new senior executive leaders coming up, you know, they just got promoted to the, to the big ranks. And I would, I would teach in there. And one of the things that I would teach is very similar to this in the fact of, uh, you know, people are always busy. They're always busy and, you know, 15 minute increments on their calendars and they're walking through the organization and that, you know, they feel important, but if someone stops them and says, you know, Hey boss, got a second? You know, the the most important thing that you can do in the world is stop, acknowledge that person and slow down and just make them feel like they are the most important person in the world. And if you do that, 
that transfers, that energy transfers, that they believe that they are the most important thing, and you just become a better person for it. And I love your analogies of, of being able to do this and the importance of, you know what, before you go in those chaotic environments, just take a minute. It's just a minute and it will change the way your day is. It's, it's beautiful. Thank you. So you asked, and, and I, I don't think I answered your question very directly, so I'll answer it very directly. You know, when you're in that state of, of stress and you're freaking out and there's anxiety, you know, can breath help you to, to pivot that? And the answer is an absolute hard yes. Think of it. When was the last time you were so excited, you were so scared, you were so flustered? What's the first thing they tell you to do? James, just breathe. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. There you go. Just breathe. And, if and you now just you've taught us the way to breathe correctly, too, yes. though. That's, that's now you it. know that if you just breathe, you can have that state shift, right? They give you the paper bag, right? Breathe into the paper bag. <laughs> You're that's hyperventilating. Right. You know what the paper bag does? It just, it just gives you a framework and a box to put the breath in. So now you have a visual of the bag blowing up and the bag inhaling. The bag blowing up, the bag inhaling. And now that you have that visual, you have that conscious breath, and now that breath starts to automatically slow down, right? Makes so much sense. So, absolutely. So now, again, you know, from the outside looking in, Dylan looks like a fucking wizard, but the reality is, is that the wizard only knows, the wizard is just truly a scientist. The wizard knows the magic potion. The wizard, the wizard knows, if you will, the magician knows the psychology and the framework behind the bag, behind the just breathe. But to the outside world, it looks like, oh my gosh. So now you know what the scientist knows. So now everyone listening to this, you are now the wizard of your own life. Amen. That's so true. You know, it's it, it's just the the fundamentals. You know, I don't pretend to be this great leader and and know new things. Leadership has been practiced since the beginning of time. It's just a matter of executing on the right ones, understanding the right formulas, so that you can be the wizard on some of these things. There's no doubt. So, Dylan, here here here's one I'd like to come close to wrapping up on. So, we talked about how meditation is important and and where it really you know transforms you. Uh, and then, you know, in the morning and then, in, you know, during your day, you're, you've got these breathing techniques. How about the wind down time at night? How important do you believe it is for sleep? And, and how does somebody actually sleep? Or is there a way to really sleep? Because you always hear, you always hear about the, the dangers of not sleeping correctly. So for me, I, I, I do believe that sleep is very important, but I also believe that, um, you know, if you go back, if you go back far enough and you trace history and you trace culture, we were prompted to sleep in eight hour intervals. And I have my own thoughts around why that is, but if you go back far enough, you'll recognize it. You know, we lived life according to the circadian rhythm, which is that 12 hour rhythmic biological clock, if you will, for those who are not familiar yep. with it, look it up, right? And so in in the very, very, very way back early civilizations, we slept in, in, in more of like three to five hour shifts. Mm. And so, you know, think about it. Um, when we wanted to hunt certain animals, certain animals are nocturnal, so we couldn't hunt them during the day. So we sleep during the day. There were times when different geos, like, it was hot, it was cold, and it was better to stay inside from the sun and the shelter and better and easier to work at night. So, you know what? To me, sleeping, the idea of sleeping eight hours a night has become just commercialized. Hmm. Now, with that being said, um, it's not our natural tendency to do that. So that's why melatonin, that's why late night movies, that's why reading in bed, that's why all these things to kind of put us in that zone. And here's what I say. For me, it's, again, coming back to that breath. So we go, 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 go. Most of us are in fight or flight all day. So one of the quickest and easiest things to do to wind down at night is that exercise that you and I just did. Do it right before bed. You know, mm. we've learned to count sheep, right, to go to sleep <laughs> as a kid. So let's, let's take that. I love that. Here goes. Ready? One, two, three. Notice I didn't go one, two, three, four, five, six. So guess what? Right. Us counting sheep is just a visual to create the cadence of breath to slow it down. Sure is. 
So now when we count, so I say count sheep, find your breath, slow it down. And when you do that, then that breath comes slower and slower and you, you recognize your body start to let, let go and release and release and soften and soften and, you know, slumber off. Now, the other thing is, is that, you know, here's some practical things that we can do. Um, you know, we're in front of screens all day. You know, our light bulbs have become better and better and better. Um, we're under artificial light all day. And that artificial light, that blue light, robs our body of melatonin. So what have we been taught to do? Read, watch TV, work till it's time to go to bed. I say have the discipline to set the alarm and set the timers on all your stuff so everything shuts down an hour before you go to bed. Mm. Now, I recognize that's easier said than done. So here's the, here's the hack. If I'm going to work all the way up to 10 o'clock and then go get in bed, I'm going to wear blue blockers. And the blue blockers is going to block the blue light to allow my body to produce some melatonin. So when I lay down, naturally, I'm going to drift off a little bit better. So if you're going to work and you're going to hustle and grind to the, to the bell, great. Invest in a $30 pair of blue blockers. Great little hack to wind down. If you have the discipline to turn everything off an hour before, find that quiet setting. Find that breath. You know what? Make that bedroom the sanctuary, mm. right? Make Great. it so that the colors are calming. Guess what? Here's a funny thing. What is, what is the thing that we look to as a symbolism for love? A red heart. Right. But if you deep dive into, into colors, you recognize that red is the color that represents anger and aggression. Hmm. So we all wonder why love hurts so much. <laughs> It's true. It's right? true. So another little hack, get rid of all the red in your room. Wow. Put never heard colors. that. Put soothing colors. Understand. Listen, if you go to my website, my back, my background color is green. You know why? Green is associated with love. Green is associated with calm. Green is associated oh, with everything that I stand for. And so, you know, so have the discipline to set, because again, we, we all really buy into cognitive psychology, which is our environment. So create the environment. Create the environment. So there are things that you can do externally because here's the thing. I recognize that I'm really good at living in my internal world, but I also recognize that that is just not the norm. Most of us live in the external world. So create some hacks. Turn off the screens. Put on the blue blockers. Change the colors in your sanctuary. Breathe. And if you can execute to this, those few very simple things and I'm mean, just going to ask you, are those things simply enough that they're doable and manageable? Without a doubt. Right. Without a doubt. If you, yep. if you can just have the simple, basic discipline to do those things, the rest of your routine will reveal itself. And for some of you, it might be listening to soothing music. For some of you, it might be, you know, reading a book. But guess what? Now it's a different book because you recognize that when you're in that state, you, now you're winding down into theta state. And when mm -hmm. you're in theta state, that's when you're most, most open to suggestions. So guess what? You, you can't figure out why you're angry all the time, but yet every night you fall asleep with, uh, you know, I don't know, what's a, what's a battlefield earth or something like that. Some crazy <laughs> movie playing in the background. You wonder why you're in fear all the time. It's because when your brain is most malleable, you're watching scary movies. Oh, but then right. you yeah. start to become right. conscious of that theta state and you start to take advantage of that theta state. And maybe then you start to listen to some educational books and maybe you start to listen to some spiritual books or maybe you start to consume something else that benefits you. And I know for a fact that your subconscious is in charge. And so guess what? There are many times when I go to bed at night and I have a dialogue with my subconscious subconscious. When I wake up six hours from now, I need to be 100% healthy. All my aches and pains are gone because I have a big workout tomorrow and I'm going to celebrate afterwards. And I might mm. be feeling like crap. And when I wake up, oddly enough, my body feels good. I love it. Right. I love it. The power, so, the power is choice. Yep. Absolutely. So power of choice. So there, a nighttime routine, I believe, is very, very helpful, but it doesn't have to look a certain way. But I say absolutely start with those tips and tricks and it will guide you to the routine that works best for you and that's going to serve you at the highest. Dag Dylan, you have uh, you have enlightened us today. That is for sure. Can't thank you enough for a lot of these tips and tricks. There's there, We have picked your brain. I have. 
uh, for the last 45 minutes that uh, I think is going to change a lot of people that are listening to this. And again, you know, there is power in choice, like you say. And I, th- I think these things that you just asked the two minutes ago, you know, are they not simple to help make small changes? And they are. They are for sure. So I have to ask you, what's coming up in your life? What's what's out there? What's out there for you right now that's uh, exciting in your life? Oh man, everything, but I also, <laughs> believe in, I also believe in the powers of three. So I'll narrow it down to three. Um, I've got, I've got a virtual event that's happening um, next week on the 12th and 13th. That's free to the public. Um, it's going to be a 90 minute session each day. And it's going to talk to a lot of these tactical things that I just spoke about. So a lot of my content out there is high level strategy. This is going to be the nitty gritty of how we do things like I just talked about, right? The, the nuts and bolts of it. So that's really cool. Um, I've got a great, where do they, where do they go to find that? Um, is, so you can find that on my website at dylanolly.net. You can find it on LinkedIn, you can find it on Facebook, you can find it on my Instagram at Dylan D A Ali. And I will actually send you the link to it afterwards if you want to share it out to any of your audience. I will. I certainly um, will. I think that's phenomenal. Um, I've got another great event that I'm putting out, but the biggest thing that I want to share and celebrate is that my birthday is on the 21st. Happy and birthday. Uni- Thank you. And the universe has delivered me such a great gift that, uh, I've got a magazine cover and a four-page feature article coming out on the 20th. Um, Holy and it's cow. Global Achievers Magazine. So, um, yeah, that's the big thing that I've got coming up that I'm pretty excited about. So if I want to share anything with the audience, is check out the magazine and, uh, you know what, show your boy a little love in there. And uh, I'm going to be pretty excited. I've got my spot on the wall here picked out for my first magazine cover. How exciting is I've that? Got- yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I've got the space aligned for the next 10 to come. <laughs> As it will be. There's there's no doubt in my mind for sure. Well, Dylan, I'll tell you this. This is what we're going to do. Although uh, the folks that may be listening to us on the podcast, um, you know, some of these events may have already happened. But what will probably have really happened is I am going to preach this from the highest mountain as soon as we hang up from this podcast to make sure everybody gets a preview of who you are uh, as early as possible. And really, I really hope that our audience will, will go to these events and, and learn from you and then be driven to go to this podcast and kind of, kind of hear some more tips and tricks from you. So Dylan, it's been an amazing hour with you. We are certainly a better tribe now than we were an hour ago for being in your presence. So we can't thank you enough again for uh, spending this time with us. Well, my man, thank you so much. And the pleasure was all mine. And um, I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate you sharing this time and space with me. Awesome, Dylan. Until we speak again, have a great day. Yes, sir. Have a beautiful day, my man. Thanks for joining our leadership movement this week. Talking to Dylan about what you are seeking is also seeking you is a powerful message of self-reflection that we can all take forward in our lives. Don't forget our show notes are posted on the website with key leader takeaways and be sure to subscribe to the podcast and tell a friend so we can continue to build on our tribe. Join our Facebook group to get even more behind the scenes action. And until next time, remember that iron sharpens iron. Make yourself and others around you better every single day.